Hello and welcome to the RPG Blender, where we give lesser played games and forgotten settings the roll of the dice they deserve. I'm your host, Game Master George, and today we are continuing our look at running the games in the Kids on Bikes RPG series. We're taking a look at not just one or two, but all three books in the Kids on Bikes line. We've already covered the unique way that they build their worlds, and now today we are going to be taking a look at the character creation process. So if you're interested in learning about this fantastic series of games, go ahead and click that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you can be notified when our next videos go live. Meanwhile, if you want to see any of the tips in action, go ahead and check out our Twitch page at twitch.tv slash rpgblender. We're currently running a game of Kids on Brooms. You can catch up on our past runs of this game and see the character creation process by checking out the links in the description. So without any further delay, let's dive right into Let's Run Kids on Bikes. Character Creation. Like with the setting, character creation follows some similar steps for each of these games. Each one does have its unique elements, but the basic bones of character creation remains the same. You assign your six statistics, or choose a trope which assigns them for you, answer some questions about your character, answer some questions about your character's relationship with the other characters, and then give yourselves some strengths and weaknesses. As we go through this game by game, we'll be talking about the slight differences in how each of these games handles those steps, but for the most part, those are the four main points of the character creation. So let's start by talking about the original game. Since Kids on Bikes is the first game in this line, we'll cover the full mechanics here, and then we'll reference back to it when the other games overlap. Now the first thing that I want to talk about here is the tropes. In Kids on Bikes, you have the option to select a trope. When you do so, it predefines your statistics, making it easier for you to jump right into the game, but giving you a little less freedom in how you build your character. However, since many of the character creation steps are done for you when you follow the tropes method, I'm going to be talking about the custom character creation throughout this. I'll make note as we go of things that would be determined by the trope rather than choice, but I believe it's more valuable for you to understand how you go through this step-by-step -step for a custom character rather than just choosing one of the tropes. So, the first thing that you're going to have to do is assign your statistics. Every character in Kids on Bikes has six statistics. They are Brains, Brawn, Fight, Flight, Charm, and Grit. Brains is the stat that determines how book smart they are. Brawn is the brute strength that your character has. Fight is your ability to fight, and flight is your ability to run away. Charm is how socially adept a character is, and grit is how hard it is to break your character emotionally or physically. Into each one of these stats, you will assign one of the six standard dice. That is, a d4, a d6, a d8, a d10, a d12, and a d20. From then on, whenever you need to make a roll of that appropriate type, that is the die that you will roll. Once your six stats are assigned, you're going to select the age of your character. Your character can be a child, a teenager, or an adult. The age that you choose not only is going to have social ramifications, but is actually going to affect your statistics and give you a certain strength. Children will add plus one to their flight and charm checks. Teens will add one to their fight and brawn checks, and adults will add one to their brains and their grit. Once your age is selected, we move on to your strengths. Each of your characters receives one strength for free based on their age. If you selected child, you automatically get the quick healing strength. However, you cannot take the rebellious strength. As a teen, you automatically get the rebellious strength and adults automatically get the skilled at blank strength. This means that they'll be able to select one action that they are particularly skilled with. Once you have your automatic strength, you'll be able to select two more. These strengths are found in Appendix B on page 59 in the core book. They are such things as Lucky, which will allow you to spend adversity tokens to re-roll a stat check or Treasure Hunter, which will let you spend an adversity token to find something useful in your surroundings. Or Wealthy, which... I guess I don't really need to explain Wealthy. From there, once you've selected your two strengths, you will also select 
two flaws. These flaws are found on Appendix C on page 61, but unlike strengths, they don't have a specific mechanical effect when you choose them. Instead, flaws are a personality trait that should be affecting the way that you are playing your character. Once you've selected your flaws, we move on to what I believe is the meat of this character creation, and those are your character questions. Each person will have to answer two questions about themselves. What are these questions? If you've been using the tropes, then there are two questions that are assigned with your trope itself. However, if you have not, then my recommendation would be for your game master to look at that list of tropes, to pick one that kind of fits with the character that you've been building, and give you the questions from that trope. Otherwise, if you'd prefer, feel free to create your own questions. If your players have already started fleshing out their characters, there may be questions that have naturally arisen. The main thing with these questions, however, is that one should be somewhat positive, and one should be somewhat negative. As an example, if you chose the loner weirdo trope, question one is, why are you happier fending for yourself? Meanwhile, question two is, what part of the cool kid life do you wish you had just a little bit? So one question that fleshes out something positive and uplifting about the character, and something that is a little bit of a downer. Once each of your players have answered two questions about themselves, there should be a very good idea going around the table about what each of the characters are about. So now, it's time for your characters to meet each other. In the next step, your players will be answering questions about each other's characters. They'll be building out the relationship history that they have, creating a more fleshed out world, relationship, and making your job of getting the party together even easier. The book offers three different options for these questions. There are the quick start questions, one-sided questions, and complete questions. However, I found that my players enjoyed this aspect more than anything else in the character creation. So I went a little bit beyond with my own games, so I'm going to introduce this fourth method, which we'll call Truly Complete Questions. Starting from the top, quick start questions are not recommended. Not by me and not by the book. It doesn't build enough relationship between your party to really have this mean anything to them. But if you're just looking for a quick way to do it, it's an option. The way that this will work is each player will answer one question about the player to their left. In order to do so, they will determine if they have a mostly positive opinion of this person, mostly negative opinion of this person, or if they don't really know them. Once they determine that, they will roll a d20 and answer the resulting question on the appropriate chart. Pages 56 through 58 contain the three charts, one each for positive, negative, and don't know. Each player will answer just one question about the player on their left, and once everybody's answered that one question, this step is over. As I mentioned, I don't particularly like this method, and the book itself doesn't suggest it, so I wouldn't recommend going this route. For one-sided questions, each character will end up answering one question about every other character at the table. So you'll start with one player. They will decide if they have a positive, negative, or don't know opinion of another person. If they have positive or negative, they will answer the question from the appropriate list, and then the person that they selected will answer a question about them. They will, however, not select positive, negative, or don't know. Instead, if the original player selected positive or negative, then this player will answer the opposite. If they chose don't know, then they simply answer another don't know question. So, if player one selects player two, and says that they have a mostly positive opinion about player two, then player two will have to answer a negative question about player one. Player two will then select another person at the table and do the same to them. This will continue moving around the group until every player has answered one question about every other player. Finally, from the official methods, there is the complete question. Each player will, in this variant, answer one or two questions about every other player at the table. The first player will go, and going player by player, they will decide if they know that character or if they don't. If they know the character, then they're going to answer one positive and one negative question about them. 
If they don't know the character, then they answer just one don't know question. Play continues around the board with every player going through this same step for every single character. The end result being that everyone will have answered one or two questions about every single other player. This is a very nice method of doing things, but I personally like to do a combination of options two and three. The way that I run it is I have each player go person by person and determine if they have a positive or negative or don't know opinion of them. Then, like with the one-sided questions, that player will answer a question back. In positive or negative, this will be the opposite or another from the don't know. This player continues around until they have done this for every single other player, like for the complete questions. Then, play moves to the next player. They will then repeat this process for every player, including the one who just went. So, if player 1 gave player 2 a mostly positive opinion, then player 2 had to answer a negative question back. Now when it gets to player 2, they don't have to select negative of player 1. They can select positive signifying that they actually have a mostly positive opinion about them. But they then answer that positive question, and player one has to then answer a negative question back. This creates a hugely interweaving nest of relationships, more so, I believe, than even the complete questions. The act of choosing whether you have a positive or negative opinion of every other player there has a big impact on the way the rest of the game is going to go. But meanwhile, I don't think that the single questions back and forth of the one-sided questions really gets enough of the relationships in these actual questions. So I use this method, which is a hybrid of both one-sided and complete, in order to create something that I think creates the perfect level of detailed character interactions. That said, this takes a long time. If your players are not invested in this, don't use my method. It, it will not work for them if they are not invested in this relationship question system. However, if you have players that like to roleplay and like the character dynamics, I think you will get a lot of return on your investment of the time that you devote to this method. Anyway, now that we've finished the relationship questions, we move on to some finishing touches. Every player will at this point need, of course, a full name and they will need to determine their motivation. The motivation should be something that strongly motivates them, not a temporary goal. This should be something that is intrinsic in their being, in the way that they approach life. It doesn't need to apply to every situation, but it should be something that is a driving force in their life. Your players can share this with each other if they like, or they can just share it with you, the game master. Once the motivation is determined, they'll move on to a fear. This is a deep-rooted psychological fear of something. It could be any kind of fear, really, but it should be something that could come up in play, because there are some mechanical implications of their fear. Finally, your players will need to determine what is in their backpack. These are the things that the character is never without. So grab a backpack, throw it in front of your players, and say, all right, think about what you could reasonably fit in this bag. If you can fit it, write it in your bag. If you think that it is something that your character would reasonably have with them at all times. Now, of course, this doesn't necessarily mean that they're carrying around a backpack with them. For an adult, it could be the trunk of the car or a briefcase. And with that, the characters are done, and you are ready to play some kids on bikes. Which means it's time to abandon kids on bikes and move on to teens in space. So teens in space character creation. How does it differ from kids on bikes? For the most part, the mechanics of the game are the same. You're still going to be assigning your six stats, answering relationship questions, and getting some strengths. But there are some slight differences here, and actually there are more differences with the character creation process with this than there are with kids on brooms. So to start with, rather than selecting an age, you are selecting a species. The game gives some suggestion of species, like Abyssians, or Informians, Raskog, or Skitchlings, but you can create your own if you like. These species give the bonus to your stats, like the age does in Kids on Bikes. Additionally, it gives some kind of drawback, as well as an additional question that they'll need to answer during the creation process. Now, if you decide that you want to create your own species, the general way that this should balance out 
would be pluses to two different stats and one improvement. Improvements being this system's version of strengths. There should always be the drawback and at least one additional question that comes from their species. So for example, the Abyssians, which are a water-breathing people, they get plus one to flight and brains, and the escape artist improvement. Their drawback is that they must remain in water similar to their home planet in order to survive. And the question that they're given, what's the longest you've been without water? Using the species in the book as an example, you should be able to easily create your own alien races that would fit with the world that your players created. Now, aside from the species, one of the other major differences is with their character-specific questions. Now, of course, there's a difference that their species provides a new question, but also there are crew questions. On page six, there are five different questions that they should answer. These questions can be answered by multiple different players in different ways, but they should shoot to answer each of these questions at least once. Now, next, there are differences with the strengths and flaws. We'll cover the flaws first just because it's faster. The flaws are now fatal flaws. With their new name comes a new mechanical difference. When your player plays into their fatal flaw and it actually causes them negative consequences, they should be awarded with two adversity tokens instead of the usual one. We'll talk more about adversity tokens in the rules section of the game, but for now just know that adversity tokens are good, allowing them to pump up rolls or to activate certain abilities. The biggest difference with this system is with the strengths. There are no longer things called strengths in this system. Instead, your characters get improvements. Each character starts with 10 points, which they can use to purchase improvements. These improvements can be purchased for themselves personally or for their ship. Appendix G on 115 will show the personal improvements. These are things like Hotshot Pilot, making you better at flying your ship, or Overachiever, which gives you a bonus to your role when talking with an authority figure. Meanwhile, as I mentioned, they can also spend these points to improve their ship. These ship improvements are in Appendix B on page 64. These will be such things as enhanced scanners, or a hollow deck. Things to make their ship more powerful or more livable. Now once your players have spent those 10 points, that's really all the differences between this system's character creation and that of Kids on Bikes. With one little exception. See, in this game, they treat the character relationship questions as optional. I do not agree with that. At all. I think the character relationship questions are the meat of what makes this line of game special. Now, thankfully, they didn't remove them. They still have their unique relationship questions in this book. Just, in my opinion, ignore the part where it says it's optional. These questions are well worth the time, and I would never recommend skipping them. Now, aside from those differences, really, you can play most of the character creation just like you would for kids on bikes. So since we've already covered that in exhaustive detail, let's move on to the third game in this line, Kids on Brooms. Kids on Brooms takes a step back from Teens in Space in terms of changes from the Kids on Bikes system. Kids on Brooms is fairly similar to Kids on Bikes. There are no major changes like swapping in species or the improvements tables. Instead, the variants here will come with some of the magical elements. So again, your players will assign their stats. They will select their age. In this case, the age will be underclass, upperclass, or faculty. These correspond almost directly to child, teen, and adult. Underclass get a plus one in flight and charm, and get the innocence strength. Upperclass get plus one in fight and brawn, and get the trained in strength. And faculty get plus one in brains and grit, and get the studied in strength. From there, they again select their strengths and flaws, and then they choose their familiar. This familiar is almost a physical manifestation of some aspect of their personality. They will have a limited one-way psychic connection with this familiar and be able to ask it to complete small tasks within reason for the type of creature that it is. Once the familiar is chosen, they will again go through their questions. 
We're back here to the trope questions and the character relationship questions. Once the question process is done, you move on to the finishing touches. This is again the motivation, fears, and school bag. But now, they also get to select their wand and their broom. Their wand will be a combination of wood and a core. Each of the wood and the core will affect one of their six attributes. Whenever they cast magic using that wand, they will get a bonus if the magic that they're casting applies to one of those two stats. The core and the wood that they choose cannot overlap, so you can't get a plus two to brains. You have to get a plus one to brains and a plus one to flight. After the wand, they will get to choose their broom. Like the familiar, the broom should represent some aspect of their personality. There's an example list on page 25 in the core book detailing a list of brooms that they can choose. Depending on what broom they choose, they will get some kind of mechanical benefit only when they are riding on that broom. So there is one final aspect of Kids on Brooms which is unique in its character creation. It's the class schedule. This is not something that you need to do if you're doing a one-shot game, but if you're looking for campaign play, it can be useful. Each of your players will choose three classes that they are taking. They will then fill out the class schedule with those three classes on various days, as well as extracurricular activities that they are taking. These classes will allow your players to gain studied in and other strengths, which will allow them to improve their casting as your campaign continues. And that about does it for character creation. We've covered the main rules of character creation and then the variants that happen when you go for one of the other spin-off games from the Kids on Bikes series. Each of these games has something unique to it, and they each have their place on your shelf. And each one of these character creations is thematically perfect for the game that it's trying to run. And with good use of those character relationship questions, you can build a character pool that is something different from your standard Dungeons & Dragons game. Yes, it removes some of the aspect of meeting during game, but the relationships that it builds before they even get to that first session, it really helps to set the tone of the game for the remainder of a campaign or one-shot adventure. I've actually taken those relationship questions and used them for other games. And I would highly recommend doing so for yourself, even if you're not playing this game specifically. Anyway, thank you so much for taking the time to enjoy this video. I hope it helped you. I hope it's given you some kind of overview of the character creation process. There's a lot to it covering all three of these books in one video, but I think they are similar enough that it was able to hopefully go through without being too confusing. Let us know in the comments if it helped you out. If there was anything that you think we missed that we could have covered a little stronger, let us know and we'll try to improve as we move forward. If it helped you out, please like, comment, subscribe, do all that stuff that really helps us out. It really helps the channel to grow when you interact with this video or just drop a subscribe. We have more videos coming, so be sure that you've subscribed if you are interested in learning how to play not just the remainder of this game, but all of the games that we have lined up for the future. And if these books interest you, consider picking them up for yourselves. We have affiliate links in the description, and if you pick it up, not only will you add a new book to your collection, you'll also help support the channel. Anyway, thank you again, and remember, there's gaming outside the Forgotten Realms.